Dale of Merchants, or Merchants of Dale, as I often mislabel it. It's a fun, fancy-free, fur-bait deck-building game from only a few years ago. Get ready to indulge in your closet furry feelings with this one. Here are the stats. Let's get into it. You get a double-sided market board with a day side for the normies or a night side for you edgy kids out there, and a cute little custom red ocelot die. Since it's a card game, you also get 110 cards, split into seven sets. 15 snappy scholar macaws, who let you live the fantasy of controlling your own finances. 15 dealing giant pandas, who let you manipulate the market from inside. 15 thieving northern raccoons, who let you ignore species profiling and steal cards from other players. 15 hoarding flying squirrels, who let you responsibly recycle your junk in a profit. 15 lucky ocelots, who make all strategy go out the window, while you roll a cute little custom die. 15 adapting veiled chameleons, who let you copy your successful opponents for a profit like a good little capitalist. And 20 junk cards, which don't get a fun name because they're a bunch of garbage. The cards are set up like this. The value, one through five, in the upper left corner. Right below that, the set icon, and sometimes, a bonus action icon. Across the top edge, you have the card's name and, in italics, the set name. To the bottom left of the anthropomorphic art, you'll see the card's type, either technique, for effects you have to actively perform, passive, for effects that are always in effect, or rubbish, which is just the junk cards. Below that is the card's effect, which is what the card will do when you have slash use it, and in italics, at the very bottom, is flavor text, for anyone curious about this furious setting. Whomsoever completes eight stall stacks of increasing size shall be declared the winner of Dale of Merchants. First, setup. All of the players have to agree on the sets to include in this game. There needs to be one set per player, plus one extra sneaky set. Each player gets a deck, which is made up of one one-valued card from each set you're using, plus enough junk cards to make a 10-card deck. Everybody shuffles their own deck and puts it in front of themselves, leaving enough room for eight stacks of cards lined up horizontally. That's the stall area. Put the remaining junk cards in their own trash pile, somewhere near enough that you can reach them, but far enough away that you don't have to look at them. Put all of the remaining one-valued cards back in the box. You don't need them. Shuffle together the rest of the Animal Folk cards from the sets you picked to form the market deck. Put this within reach of all the players and place the market board next to it. Draw five cards from the market deck and place them in the spaces on the market board, right to left. Now, everyone draws five cards from their own deck. Time to play! Whoever woke up earliest today goes first. If you already played, whoever lost goes first. If you're playing with more than two people, again, the losers can battle for the privilege to go first. Starting with that player, and continuing clockwise, each player takes a turn that consists of two phases, taking actions and cleaning up. In the action phase, you can take one of four actions. Market, to purchase a card from the market board. Technique, to play a technique card's effect and possibly get a bonus action. Stall, to ironically move the game forward by building one of your all-important stall stacks. Or inventory, to discard any number of cards from your hand. Then, time to clean up. Draw from your own deck until you have five cards, then fill the empty market slots. The cleanup phase is the only time you draw or put new cards into the market, unless a card's effect says otherwise. Once a player uses a stall action to place their eighth and final stall, they shall be declared the winner of the annual trading competition and awarded a membership to the esteemed guild of extraordinary traders. The other traders will have to wait until next year to try their paw once more. That's all the basics, so let's go over the actions in full. When you take the market action, you must discard cards from your hand whose values add up to at least the cost of the card in the market you want to purchase. The cost of the card is the value of the rightmost card in the market, plus whatever number is above that specific card. You can pay with a higher value than needed, as long as you couldn't pay less with those same cards. No throwing random cards into your payment to get rid of them. Put the purchase card into your hand. When you take the technique action, you show the technique card you're using to the other players, then perform all of the actions described in the card's effects. Then, you discard the card. If the card had a bonus action symbol, you now get to take another action. When you take the stall action, you build a stall stack in your stall area, the stalls must each normally contain only one type of animal folk, no junk cards, and must be valued one through eight, 
left to right. You make the stack by placing animal folk cards from your hand into the stall area whose total values add up to the required number for that stack. Each individual stack can be a different type of animal folk. When you take the inventory action, just discard as many cards as you want from your hand. You don't draw back up until the next phase, which is fill your hand. Draw cards from your deck until you have five in your hand. If your deck runs out before you have five, shuffle your discard pile to form a new deck. If you still can't draw up to five, take the filthy junk cards until you can. If the junk cards aren't enough, start pulling one value cards from the sets you didn't use in the box. Finally, fill the market by shifting the cards to the right to fill in any gaps. Then draw new cards from the market deck to fill the remaining gaps, right to left. If the market deck runs out, shuffle the market discard to form a new market deck. If the deck and discard are empty, just leave those slots empty. If you've already played all of the standard variations of the game and, somehow, in this digital age, have three other people physically in the room with you, you can play the four-player team variant. It's mostly the same, with these changes. You'll need a table with four sides. Break up into teams of two. One person sits on each side of the table, with teammates sat across from each other. Unlike a normal four-player game, you'll only use four Animal Folk sets. Use four one-valued Animal Folk cards from one of the sets you aren't using to make enough junk for four 10-card decks. Each team shares a stall, which needs to be built up to 10 stacks rather than eight. When you perform a stall action, you and your teammate can combine cards from both of your hands to make the stack. If a card says another player, that player can be your teammate. If a card says other player, that player must be from the opponent team. If a card says all players or each player, it still refers to all four players. Any and all communication must be done publicly. No secret messages, codes, or other trickery. Like most card games, all of these unique effects cause some wrinkles in the rules. In no specific order, here are the other rules. When a card says discard, that means it goes into your own personal discard pile. If it says throw away, that means it goes into the market discard pile, or junk pile if it's junk. Don't mix all that nasty junk into your nice market goods. All of the discard piles are face up in public knowledge. Anyone is allowed to look at any discarded cards at any time. Just be sure to ask before you go grabbing someone else's cards with your grubby mitts. Bonus actions only activate when you use the card for its technique effect, not when you put it in a stall stack, use it to purchase a market card, or otherwise discard it. Some cards will rearrange the cards in your stall stacks, or otherwise change their total value. It's still completed, and the next stack still needs to have one more total value than what the stack to the left's value originally was. Just count how many stacks it is from the left if you get confused. You can use a card's passive effect any time during your action phase, as long as you show that card to the other players before you do. Finally, the chameleon cards need a little explanation. These are the most strategic and complex cards. All of their passive effects make them act as a copy of another card, specified in their effect, that is, the copy printed on them, unless they copy another copy of the same card's copy, or another copy that is then a copy of the first card, or a copy of a copy of the first card's copy. That card is considered a copy of a copy of the card which is specified in the copy on the copy of the card which this is all describing. If the copy of the card makes a copy of another copy of itself or otherwise loops all this copying back to the original copy, then the card has its own value bonus section shown through the symbols, not the copy. This only lasts for the rest of the turn, or as long as the copied card's effect would last, whichever is longer. So that's Dale of Merchants. That should cover everything, but if you still have any questions, put them in the comments below. If you liked this, please take the time to click like, subscribe, and the notification bell. It would really mean a lot to me. Thanks for watching, everybody.